Welcome to the Jamal Bryant Let's Be Clear podcast, where we pray that you will be empowered, enlightened, equipped, and sometimes entertained. I have a, literally a living legend, a history maker, and a trailblazer for this generation. Everything shifted with uh, Rosa Parks, refusing to give up her seat, and as a consequence, the civil rights movement found itself in full play. My guest today, really sits on that same bus, refusing to give up her seat and really advancing forward what it looks like to be an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur who is a minority, an entrepreneur who is a woman. Would you help me get all of your daughters, nieces, sisters, and those who are forward thinkers to lean into this podcast, to listen to uh, what I think is one of the most defining minds of this generation. I'm glad to have you, Ariana. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You thank are you so amazing. Much. History always happens out of chaos. That is true. <laughs> yeah, not uh, out of times of convenience. And uh, people who are listening, they've been under a rock <laughs> and that don't know true. why you have been uh, catapulted. Uh, talk about uh, really just the last year of your life and what has happened. Oh, my gosh. Um, I serve as the CEO and co-founder of the Fearless Fund. I run the nation's first venture capital fund that's built by women of color for women of color. Yes. And from there, we ended up in a federal lawsuit. Amazing. Yes. People have conservative legal strategists are suing us, basically saying it should be illegal to do what we do. Wow. Yes. So that is very big and definitely a problem. They filed three things against my company on August 2nd, 2023. A temporary restraining order, meaning, I thought those were people, not businesses. Right, so did I. I. Said, what is this? Meaning literally to stop you from operating your business. They yeah. filed it with a deadline of August 17th because they were trying to stop a convening we were having of 2,000 people on August 18th at wow. Atlanta Symphony Hall. Wow. Yes, they withdrew the temporary restraining order yeah. after, of course, we fought back on that. Um, they filed a preliminary injunction, which is what we've been in court with lately, against one of our programs. And then the complaint case itself, that's against four of my companies. Amazing. Yes. It, it, I, I want you, I want to now go backwards uh, and talk about, uh, I've read data recently that the fastest growing population of entrepreneurs in America is black women. That is correct. That is correct. Women Black women in particular are the fastest growing demographic when it comes to entrepreneurs. We're starting businesses at exponential rates. Yeah. Women of color overall are the most founded entrepreneur demographic. They're just the least funded. Wow. Yes, the least. And it's the numbers are horrible. Yeah. Women of color receive about 0.39%. Now that's combined. Now you're talking that's black, brown, yellow. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. That's combined. Black women are even less than that in that fraction of a percent. Uh, what what uh, you've got uh, young ladies who are listening. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were to have a blank canvas, we're going to get to the lawsuits and mm -hmm. DEI and all of that. Uh, but I, I want to look from the bright side for a moment. Young women who are looking at going into business, I often say what uh, George Frazier has said, is that we were raised as minorities to pursue our passion, not necessarily to pursue the profit and presume mm. that the profit would come out of our passion. For black women, young women who are starting off in business, what are the areas you would encourage black women to pursue and go after? Well, I do believe that passion is important. But if you're going to be in business, you got to profit. <laughs> right, right. You have to profit because there's a lot of people passionate that's yes. broke. That does not work. Yes. Um, you want to make sure you have, as an investor, we look at a strong brand story, like why you got into the space. Right. What are you solving? You want to make sure you have a strong team. Are you able to execute on what this dream is? Yes. You want to make sure your product is something that people want to purchase. Um, you want to make sure that you develop traction, that there's some interest in what you're building, too. So those are just four things we initially look at as investors. But no, passion is not just enough to stay in business or to grow and scale. How, how did, what is your story? How did you end up in the position where you are? Ooh, I 
don't know if we got enough time for Listen, that, Listen, we. That's, I'm going to change the name of this show because everybody keeps saying, do we have enough time? No. Yeah. Yes, that's the name of the, the show. <laughs> yeah. Do we have enough time? All right. Because, okay, born and raised Detroit, Michigan. I've always loved business. Yeah. Um, I was a kid with the lemonade stand. Yeah. I, by high school, I was selling Mary Kay. In high school? Oh, yeah. In middle school, I was selling poinsettias. Like, I mean, wow. all different ages of life. And when right. I got down to Florida a University, I opened up a mall-based retail store, 2,500 square foot, took over to Old Walton Books. That was my first time Wow. learning how to raise capital. Yeah. And it was hard. Yeah. <laughs> And I raised a couple hundred thousand dollars, but I could remember going in banks, going places, talking to people. And I was like, these folks don't look like me. Yeah. And right before we opened, I had like all the, the hangers and the clothes and everything around me. I still remember what I had on that day. These track pants, they were tan and red with this red tank top. And I said, Aaron, don't worry about the investor landscape because one day you are going to be the business investor that you were looking for. Wow. Wow. So that's how I got into this space. A promise I made to myself, though I think I look 25, don't y'all you agree? You do, 23 um, times. <laughs> 23 times. Yeah. That was about like 20 years ago, yes. maybe plus. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> For the you sake look amazing. Of this. No, yeah. thank you. And I kept that promise to myself. In between that time, there is a derail. That's why I said, it's, do we have enough time in this, this podcast? Um, after school, I moved to Los Angeles with a job. I've always been an entrepreneur. Yeah. The store had ups and downs. One day you got $50,000, the next day is like negative 200. And right. I thought I was failing at times, but I was just young. Yeah. I wasn't aware that business just had cycles. And there were times I thought I was failing. And I wasn't failing. I just wasn't being patient. Mm. So I keep those financials on my computer, just even as a reminder, Erin, you had a profitable business. Yes. But those were your emotions at the time. And moved to LA with a job, closed the store, working for Nellius Apple Bottoms. No way. Yes, those Apple Bottom <laughs> jeans, boots with the fur, the whole world was looking at her. Yes. yes. Doing product placement. I'm placing product on Jessica Simpson, Oprah Winfrey. Got her to wear it on the show. Don't even know wow. this woman. Yes. Wow. Tyra Banks, you name it. And this is in 30-day window. They say, Erin, the president wants to meet you. I was like, well, of course. Of course, yes. the president wants to meet with yes. me. I get in there, they said, we have some unfortunate news. I said, not for me. <laughs> and they said, <laughs> we do because we have to let you go. I'm like, let me go. I've turned this place around. Right. And they said, it's being sold. And that everybody has to go. You were just the last hired, so you're the first fired. Wow. Yes. And my parents were in an unfortunate divorce case at the time. So I thought I could call home, but I have been so financially self-sufficient so long, right. I wasn't even aware of what was going on. I've been paying bills primarily since like 19. So I right. was like, what, what's the issue? Right. They were like, it's not good looking good here right now. So I was like, well, okay. I said, don't worry about me. I'll figure it out. I'll figure out life. I'll figure it out. Right. And I think I caused myself more chaos than I probably ever had in life the time I took this job. I ended up going from my apartment to my car, mm. ended up on welfare, Ooh. food stamps, just trying to figure out life. Right. And I was without a place to stay for about seven months. But I did learn some valuable lessons. I learned how to dance in the rain. So regardless of situation or <laughs> yeah. circumstance, I said, I'm going to have fun. Snuck I'm glad you found out about the rain because when you just said you learned to dance, I didn't know where that was going. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> definitely appropriate. Now, I do got a story. Yeah, no, no. Listen. <laughs> listen. No, it's, it's appropriate. It yes. will be appropriate yes. for your audience. So I... Snuck into the BET Awards. That's a whole story in itself. I did sneak into this party that Jamie Foxx was throwing, and they did have a big booty contest, and the prize was $1,000. Now, don't y'all judge. Yes. I know this is a Christian audience. Don't y'all no, judge. No, it's a, listen. <laughs> and I didn't recommend myself, but he saw me in the audience, and he said, come up. And I said, oh, thank God. I'm about to eat good tonight. So <laughs> somebody came out the audience, and they were literally like a size probably negative two and she did every twerk split you think of and right. the crowd went wild he said what you gonna do and I said well I can't do that not that I'm not able I said it's because I know the woman my mother raised I wow. said and I have to keep my dignity even in my desperation wow 
Wow. So didn't do it. And I was so grateful because my next business after that, I ran a PR and marketing company and we were out basically outsourced to executive produce one of an event that took place at his house. And when he saw me, he said, oh, he looks so familiar. And I was like, I'll just have one of those faces. Like, I wasn't about right. to remind him of nothing. <laughs> right. Yeah. But I was definitely glad I kept, like I say, my dignity, even in the midst of desperation. Because I was tired of eating off the dollar menu. No, I get it. And one day I found myself at a green light, and I wouldn't move. I was just stuck, because that's how I felt. Yeah. I said, well, where do I go? I don't even know where I'm going. Mm. Mama called, she panicked. Can't do this to me, da da this, you're across the country. And I was like, I just don't know where I'm going. Mm. And I was probably on a fast by force, not even by choice. Right. I was on bread and water <laughs> for days. Right. And somebody called and they sought me out to do some PR and marketing work. And that's how I ended up with that business. That ended up doing PR and marketing. And we serviced Sony Pictures, Universal, Walt Disney, in the area of film. Yeah. And then we also serviced um, some music artists at the time, but primarily film. How I got into that after I got the call, need somebody needs some PR marketing work, I go get office space. I live out this office building at 5900 Wilshire on the 26th floor. No way. Yes, way. And <laughs> yeah. security is there, and they're tipping me off. I find out that the Steve Harvey Morning Show takes place there, but on the 19th floor. So they're letting me know which celebrities are coming in out the door. Right. And I knew it was working when Nick Cannon, I gave him my card, and he said, oh, my gosh, I heard about you. You dope. And I'm thinking, like, I've only been doing this three weeks. Right. I said, right. I said oh, great. Who you hear about me from? Right. He said, security downstairs. No way. <laughs> I was like, oh, let me go bring them some lunch. Yes. And I just would shower LA Fitness on the bottom floor, and I'd get up every morning, and i just keep grinding it out. And just grind it out. Amazing. Yeah, and I met Coach Carter from the movie Coach Carter. Yeah. He was on the floor doing business. He said, oh, gosh, you're living in here. I would usually fall asleep much later. And I was like, yeah, I must have fell asleep early. He said, well, I'm going to help you. I said, how you going to help me? He said, I got a movie coming out. And we, um, movie studios outsource PR marketing firms. So that was when the light bulb went off. I said, wait, they do? He said, yes. Got me a check, got an apartment, kept it moving. But I said, if they do, all of them do. Yes. So I called Will Packer, and people know the name now. This was not a household name right. by any means at the time. That FAMU connection. Exactly. Yeah. He and Rob Hardy, his partner, when I had my store, they used to promote their DVDs by putting posters and meet and greets in my store. No way. Yes. So I called. I said, okay, well, I think I got something. And he said, and your timing couldn't be more perfect. He said, we're getting ready for our first big theatrical release. It was Stomp the Yard. Good and grief. oh no, I've done many number one movies yeah. with Will. So yeah. I was like, okay. And from there, the phone just started ringing. But about ten years into doing this business, I started meeting people in venture capital, and I never heard of it before, really. Yeah. I said, this is how I'm making good on that promise I gave myself in college. I said, I'm gonna start a fund for women of color entrepreneurs, and I'm gonna fund their businesses. I love it. You all have given out up to this date, how much to minority businesses? Oh, gosh. Um, we've raised well over 50, but we've deployed an investment capital, I think 27 million. Amazing. I don't know the exact number, let me think of it on the grant side, because we do usually a few million a year, we, but we've helped over 500 companies in grants. We educate over 1,000 women color founders each year. And on our investment portfolio, our girls are rock stars. I love it. They, we have about a quarter of the portfolio right now. These women are doing eight-figure, year-over-year, just great growth. Yeah. Like, they're going to be headed towards exit soon. Yeah. I want to ask, because black women now are the lead, at least for our community, degree holders. Uh, they are the lead now breadwinners. They are the lead entrepreneurs. How do we get this for the brothers? The men need some of this. Um, <laughs> you got to no, help, no, help I, us out, I do please. agree. I know, trust me, because I, I get this question. Yes. <laughs> um, the numbers actually are the reason that dictate what we do. So all my clients, not even intentionally, when I had the PR marketing company, were all men. I do even angel invest in black nice. men, all nice. men. Yes. I angel invest all the time in men. But the numbers for the firm dictate what we do. 
our numbers are actually still behind yours in entrepreneurship. Wow. Yes. We're wow. founding more yes. than the men, but we are still funded less. Okay. Because there is still an element of the boys club. Oh, yes. So. Now that, that's a real thing. It is. Yeah. So there's definitely still more funding. We haven't caught up even with y'all yet. Okay. On that side, because you're yeah. correct with the degrees, with the board seats, with yes. all this other stuff. Right. Yes. But in the area of entrepreneurship funding, the men are still ahead of the women. I'll give an example. Women overall, regardless of race, are only at 1.9%. No way. Yes way. So that means the other 98% yeah. has gone to men. And mind you, it's probably not black men, but their percent is still higher than the women. No, that's incredible. It is. How, how um, do you maintain the balance of um, now becoming a public figure while doing private business. So it. I'm seeing you on the Today Show, The View. I'm seeing you all over social media. You done kidnapped my whole Explore page. <laughs> uh, but you didn't go into this work for that. No. <laughs> uh, and then the last year has really thrust you into a, another place. My dad said something to me uh, some years ago that messed me up. He said, this is the first generation where you can become a celebrity without having talent. You are becoming a celebrity for doing the work, not for singing, not for mm -hmm. dancing, <laughs> not for move, but really advancing uh, people. And with that, you got to deal with the heat of a celebrity while you are in reality a servant. Yeah, because I, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't plan for this. Yes. Um, I always knew I'd create impact in the world. Yes. I, I've always known that in my heart. I've always believed myself to be dynamic. Um, but I think it's no different than when you gave the Rosa Parks example. Yeah. Where if she wanted to go to the president's inauguration, she's going to get the same ticket as Aretha Franklin. Right. So I do think that that can happen, which I'm living it right now. Um, and that's somebody who's like a godmother to me. Like right. I grew up around Rosa Parks. Oh, Detroit. Yes. Detroit. Detroit. Well, not even that. Yeah. That was my father's client growing up. Wow. Oh no. Wow. Yes. This no, is I no. I mean, like a real that. godmother. This is somebody yeah, yeah, I check yeah. on after school. Wow. Yes. I traveled two summers with her of my high schools. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. Thank. 15 and 16. So you were really prepared for this without even knowing that this yeah. was preparation. I did not know that at the time. Yeah. We, I mean, I have pictures with her that are endless. I had no clue. What uh, would you say? Uh, but I don't know if I answered your question. You said, how do I handle the both? Y yeah. I how do you I'm just do taking that? it one day at a time. Yeah. Yeah. I, what do you see as next? Because now people who are not are really looking at uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, announcing it amplified with President Day at Harvard. Uh, we're seeing it uh, amplified with so many corporations who made it pledges around George Floyd. And immediately after uh, it was no longer reg regulated, they pulled it back the, the next day within 24 hours. Oh, it's a mess. Yeah, how, how do we keep that high beam focus on? Um, this is so layered. Right now in the news, just as of last week, yeah. the governor of Utah signed a bill along with five other states that has made DEI illegal. Wow. Oh, yeah. I'll pull it up. It's New York Times. Y'all wow. can pull it up. Seriously. It's now prohibited. The law has prohibited. That's why my case is such a precedent case. Yeah. It's because they're trying to use the law to say that these types of programs, this type of funding should be illegal. Not just us saying it. They don't right. want it to exist at all. Wow. Oh, yes. And laws are being made and created in live time while I'm in a federal lawsuit to stop this. Yeah. I said, this is wild. And it, it is sophisticated racism. Uh, so in the hour of Rosa Parks, you could uh, march until the whites only sign is down. Mm -hmm. You can march until you can eat at the lunch counter. Uh, but DEI is a little bit different because you have to have the data. You got to be able to prove it. Uh, and so it is harder uh, to get people mobilized 
around it because they saying I got a job. It is. <laughs> yeah, there I is, got there a, is a lack of motor, um, momentum. Yes. Because I said, oh God, if these people don't wake up, this is they, they're trying to make this illegal. Right. Some people, yeah, they may say they have a job, but they may not even know they're the minority mandate at their job. Wow. They were hired because of DEI. Right. And right. they may not even know it. Yeah. So it's 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 very loaded right now. People have got to be intentional with their legis their law their legislation their legislators holding them accountable. It's that serious. People need to be writing to their Congress people saying we need policies to protect our access to capital because yeah. y'all are trying to take it away. It has been proven in studies that when you don't have an emphasis on race conscious things, yeah, then race especially ours, gets left behind. That's powerful. I went to court uh, with you a couple of months ago in Atlanta. I was sitting beside Reverend Sharpton. And uh, Reverend Sharpton leaned over to me and said, every head of every major civil rights organization should be here. Oh, yeah. That this is the most critical court case of this generation. And people don't even realize what really is at stake. Mm -hmm. I, I want you to tell, what's at stake? Everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, is. it is. And, that, and I, I really need everybody watching to make sure you share this video, show this with your friends. Yeah. We got to get the awareness out. Um, contracts are at stake. Jobs are at stake. Yeah. Education is at stake. HBCUs are at stake because wow. that's race conscious. Anything that's race conscious is at stake. Yeah. Anything designed for black people is at stake. Anything designed for brown people is at stake. Anything gender specific is at stake. Anything even, you know, religious specific is at stake. They are trying to dictate and with the preliminary injunction how we allocate our foundation dollars. Wow. Yes. Wow. I didn't realize it went yes. that deep. Yeah, so that's why on our Mickey's brief, which just so you guys know, because trust me, I'm learning all this stuff at the same time y'all are. Right. Um, Amicus briefs are documents people can provide in support of our argument organization. So the Ford Foundation and all the big foundations stepped up. Yeah. To sit, send papers to say, nope, y'all can't do this. This is wrong. We had 19 attorney generals step up and say, we have got to ask for this case to be dismissed. We have had about a thousand papers of people writing in for amicus briefs to the court saying y'all need to stop this mm. it is so much at stake here but yeah anything race conscious um right after my suit happened the government stopped their 8a program you can even look it up i'm filed on august 2nd but i'm hold on let's do remedial summer school real quick Tell everybody what the AA did. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got you. The SBA 8A program, it is a minority certification program. So say if you are black or brown or female and have a business and you want to get government contracts and government money, it goes through the 8A program. Yes. So on August 2nd, me and all my companies are sued. Now, mind you, it was a sunny day in Atlanta. I found out in the news we had a federal no lawsuit. No way. Oh, no, I was blindsided. No way. Yeah, I'm seeing in the news we got a lawsuit. <laughs> yeah, I right. thought it was a hoax. I said, no, we don't. <laughs> yeah. So then I told my staff, well, look it up. I said, if it's a federal lawsuit, you gotta, it's got to be public. Right. Well, they found it, and I was like, Ben Crump, everybody else start calling on speed dial. I said, hey, I need some help. Right, right. So we're sued August 2nd. By August 3rd, the article reads, the, a the SBA 8A program is paused. I said, the government? They operated out of fear. Yeah. They even said, we don't have the money to fight lawsuits the way you guys do as private entities. I said, well, shoot, you got more cash than me right, right. now. Let yeah. me know what's right. going on. Right. But people just started backtracking their programs out of fear. So on that date, the minority certifications got paused. People who were filing for them couldn't get them. The minority grants got stopped. All this was happening at the government. It was yes. nuts. I was like, what? We're in the middle of which is probably going to be one of the most tense presidential election cycles. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make you moderator of the presidential debate oh, for 90 seconds. Know. If you have in front of you Donald Trump and Sorry. Joe Biden, <laughs> both of them are in front of you. You're saying, listen, I represent a legion of forward-thinking black women mm -hmm. who are founders but not funded. I'm taking your language. What would you want to hear from either candidate? Do you say, okay, well, th this is a campaign I can get with? 
That is so loaded, Dr. Brown. Because <laughs> I got um, questions uh, even yes. beyond my court case. That, yes. that is so loaded. But on this subject, I'm in court right now on according to constitutional law yeah. of Section 1981 of the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Wow. So slavery was abolished in 1865. Exactly. When I saw the court papers, I thought only civil rights I act, act I knew of was Dr. King in 64. Right. <laughs> right. So I said, is this another hoax? Right. Then I looked it up, and that law states that anybody non-white can now enter into contracts. So prior to the abolishment of slavery in 1865, it was illegal for black people to even enter into contracts. No way. Yes way. This law that they are putting me in court at saying that I am violating it was put in place to protect our economic freedom. Yes. So my question, yes. <laughs> of course, to the presidential candidates would be what laws are being put in place or they're, are they going to put in place to protect our economic freedom? Yeah. I uh, was having a conversation uh, recently with a gentleman who was talking about civil rights was the next phase after civil rights. Mm -hmm. that if we don't have economic parity, then it means absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, black people are the nation's lead consumers mm -hmm. and least producers. Mm -hmm. uh, wh where are you as uh, somebody who's operating in that space What I have never heard from anybody who breathes your oxygen where are you at the whole issue of reparations? Oh. I'm, no, no, no. No, I'm going to tell you why this yes. is critical. Yes. I just attended the Black State Legislators Conference, and they had me on a panel about DEI and reparations. No way. And I made it clear to them. One, I definitely believe in it. But I made it clear. I said, if we don't win this court case... There are no reparations. Wow. Because reparations are race conscious. Yeah. Literally. Stop. They're, no, <laughs> for I said they're trying to stop everything race conscious. Yeah. So if it's race conscious, I said, and the talk on reparations and then the legislators, they said, they said, Arian's right. They no. said legally all the work we've done at a state level to try to institute reparations will be dismantled. Yeah. And outside of the government's participation and their obvious role of indebtedness, uh, wh where is it uh, really in your bailiwick in terms of corporate responsibility? Uh, because these corporations really should be participating without having it being mandated. Woo! Especially <laughs> when you said the consumer dollars. Yes. You are correct. Um, I like the civil rights analogy. I always said I was working in civil rights 2.0 when yeah. I realized that Dr. King's work ended at economic freedom. Yes. And we aren't truly free unless we, of course, we are economically free. Whew. What was the question, Dr. Yeah. Bryant? This is just loaded. Yeah. What is the responsibility of corporations? Oh. Where it, let's say the government says, no, we're not going to do it. Oh, yeah. If, as long as we are the consumers, yes, they yes. are responsible. Yes. And right now, I have been getting pressure from, I would say, a lot of people from media outlets, Roland Martin. They want to know a list. They want the list <laughs> yeah. of everybody who we should not be supporting. Wow. But you won't get a list over. <laughs> well, I'm not saying I'm not giving the list you over. You ain't giving it over yet. I'm, You're waiting to see. I'm Yes, but not that long. The, yeah. the list is going over. I'm taking meetings this week because I do need our communities aware. Yeah. Uh, one um, uh, essay that I've read is this generation is tired of marching, tired of protesting. Mm -hmm. when they weren't even doing the marching in the first place, but that's a whole nother show. Is, is economic... I'm going to say selective spending, the new boycott, the new march. If we're not going back to yes. D.C. Yeah, is that the strategy? Because I contend the Montgomery bus boycott happened going back to Godmother Rosa, not because of the speeches of Dr. King, but oh, because yeah. they withheld their money. Yeah, there was nothing moral about it. Yeah. It was they changed the economics. <laughs> right. it was no, nobody had a, a, a just decision, trust me. Right. You, you withheld the money. I think that's one way, but I think that we have to 
I hate to say this, like, but I think we have to be fully aware of our, I don't want to say, but I'll put it this way, opponent strategies. Because mm -hmm. technically, I mean, they're just looking out for their own interests. Right. We just need to develop a plan to look out for our own interests. Right. And I think that plan has to be just as multi-pronged as their plan. Like when we got sued, it wasn't a secret what Ed Bloom and his organization were doing. Right. He said, we're going to dismantle education. He said, we're going after employment. It was all written up in my case. I said, yes. he didn't wrote out the whole plan. I said, right. this is horrible. Right. Um, so we have to have a legislative plan because they're using law and litigation to basically dismantle things. We have to have, like you said, um, an economic plan as far as how we're spending our dollars. I think it's a little bit more multi-pronged, um, but we're gonna have to get a few things in place. And you're correct, it may not look like the protest of the 50s and 60s. So one of our portfolio companies said, she said, we are in um, basically a civil war. Wow. Yeah, she wow. said it Go just doesn't. She <laughs> said it just doesn't look like the form of yeah. guns and artillery. Yeah, she said, but what they're doing, the way they're waging war on us with this, she said that is that is war. She said in other countries, which is true, this would be a whole basically political uprise. This would be this would be civil unrest. Yeah, in other places, like wow. even when I go over to Cote d'Ivoire, where I hold a queenship. They were like, send the queen back here. They're treating her horrible in America. Right, right. <laughs> they were like, where's the military? I right. said, oh, gosh. Yeah, no. I said, no, the military is Protect not coming out of America to defend me. You're right. <laughs> no, but you got an army of people who have your back and an oh, uh, army you. of prayer warriors uh, who are standing around you. Of the area that gives you the greatest heartburn, as it were, around our community and economic development is what? If there was one thing that you could inject into us to know and to follow and to do what is the thing that we're not doing that you so desperately Ooh. wish we were this just this this just came in my yeah. spirit um i think one of our strategies need to we need to talk to the other side hmm. okay i'm trying to get all the right words for this so recently, um, Bill Ackman, businessman, who usually spends his money kind of liberally, he came out against DEI. And Reverend Sharpton was like, Aaron, come meet me down here. We're going to protest. I said, okay, I got you. <laughs> you I got right down there to protest. And then I said, well, where is he at? I want to talk to him. I said, because I do believe through conversation and conversing, that there can be conversion. Right. That people can be converted. Absolutely. And I said, I don't know if this, as far as protesting and everything, is the solution. I said, I've researched this man. I've watched how he spends his dollars prior to this. I don't know why he's so incentivized with this thing. I said, but I think this is worth the conversation. Right. And, um, and anytime we see words like that, where the root word is so similar, and I was just like, no, I said, through conversing, he can be converted. Right. And I said, I don't think we are taking enough time to have those discussions. I saw this, um, well, even biblically, you know, people overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word, word of one's testimony. Right, right. Yes, through conversing, we can have conversion. You're and right. that's like the faith plus works is alive example. Um, I saw a movie, I can't remember the name of it, and it was during the civil rights era, and somebody would have those debates, and they would bring both sides in. And instead of like being in like a law situation or litigating or mediation, right. they would debate it. They would have the pros to this, the cons to this. Right. And through that exercise, whoever led it, he started to convert people. Wow. Because people had a chance to express their empathy to be heard on both sides. But right now, 80% of white people's networks are 100% white. Say that again, slow. 80% <laughs> yes. of white people's networks yeah. are 100% white. Wow. Yes. So that means that I'm not having enough dialogue or opportunity to have dialogue for you to even hear my side, hmm. for you to even empathize with my life. Because no conversation. Is even happening. Yeah. 
So therefore, no conversion. When you said as the exactly, yeah. I said I think the one thing is we're going to have to orchestrate forums where people have completely different views. I remember this. I wish I remember the movie because somebody was con she was in there converting KKK members. Wow. Yes, and this was a real life story. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I gotta go find it on I Netflix. I do too. I'm like, yeah. what movie was this? And they would hold those, I guess, town hall debates or whatever. Yeah. And they would have on certain subjects and they tally it, who believes this, who believes that. But through that exercise and they kept doing it, they were converting people. Yeah. I, I uh, appreciate what it is that you do uh, through uh, your venture capital uh, uh, prowess. I want you to say a word as a pastor. Nothing irks me more than GoFundMe. <laughs> GoFundMe is not a business strategy. It is not a insurance plan for the funeral. No. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I want you to talk about um, how it is that we invest in each other. You're a Detroit baby, Motown. Mm -hmm. The greatest glaring example I talk about all the time is how Barry Gordy got his family to invest in the Motown. Mm -hmm. And they saw it. They wrote up a real contract mm -hmm. uh, on it, held them accountable. But as a consequence, nobody in the family has to work today mm -hmm. because they invested in that business. How do we do that cooperative community economics without waiting on Wells Fargo and Truist and Bank of America? How do we get that back into our community of saying what is that worthy investment? I think we just have to do it. Um, I think it just has to get done. Within my family on my mom's side, we actually do do that. Nice. We have what we call, we, our side word to is the family bank. Yeah. But um, we invest collectively. If somebody in the family wants to start a business, there's, there's seed money there for them. Um, I think you just have to continue the conversation and actually just do it. And if you don't have that type of family, because yes. it does require a mindset. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> if they do not have that mindset, then you need to surround yourself with like-minded people. Um, and maybe it could start at the church. So yeah. when you were saying um, regarding the whole GoFundMe, which for lack of better words and what he's talking about is, is I, I'm not, how should I put it? This is observation, that judgment is semi-ghetto. <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> That's right. what that is. I'll take it. I'll take it's it. It's just straight hood. But um, maybe, because we have so much power in the black church, and maybe that's something that instead of, this is me just thinking off the top of my head, brainstorming, just not teaching on economics, that we figure out some type of way to have collective economics. I don't know. But I do think that there's enough of us that would, would move on it. No, I love it. You're going to help and free a whole lot of people and don't even know it. I want you to give. We we adopting you into our family. It's just Elba's wife just did a post. He's everybody's husband. You're going to be everybody's cousin. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's cousin, I want you to help us on if a family member comes and asks for financial support, what are the three things we should ask, determine it? on whether it is that we help a family member. I think we do it just the way you said with the Barry Gordy example. Yes, the contract. Treat it just like business. Wow, wow. He showed up to his family. They didn't say, okay, here's the cash. They no. said, okay, what's the opportunity? What do you need? What is the business could, plan? Yeah, you could treat it just like business. Yes, well, you all heard it now. Don't just give that money to your nephew. <laughs> don't just give it to your cousin. And don't just give it to your adult children. You got to have some standards, some level of expertise, uh, and some vision. Mm -hmm. And vision without a plan is just a dream. Mm -hmm. Where are you all now going forward in terms of your legal gymnastics? Oof. Yeah. Um, like I said, you were in court with us. We won. They appealed right yes. after. Yes. <laughs> As we expected. We've been in appeals court in the federal level. We are waiting from a three-judge panel on what their decision is. Yes. So the second we know that, um, that's, that's pretty much where we're at. We're waiting on a three-judge panel to say if the preliminary injunction can, if it's going to happen or not happen. Are they going right. to stop this program or not stop this program? So that's where we're at at this moment. Okay. 
I love it. I am uh, appreciative. Uh, they say give uh, people their flowers while they can still smell them. Oh, I'm, thank I'm giving you. you a whole FTD bouquet oh, of 10 you. foot flowers. Uh, really thanking you. It takes a whole lot of carriage, a whole lot of faith, and a whole lot of focus uh, to do what it is that you're doing because it's so much easier to just give up. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, let me uh, say to you, uh, legalities aside, the number of black businesses that uh, you all have helped to undergird and support. Uh, as a girl dad, I am uh, just uh, oh. so grateful uh, for it and for what it is that you do. People want to know uh, how to get uh, in touch with uh, your organization, what it is that you're doing, how do they do that? Not just a girl dad. Aren't you a rattler girl dad? I am a rattler <laughs> girl dad. So I am looking for some rattler scholarship money. <laughs> So if you can find me any of that, give it to me after the broadcast hilarious, is over. Hilarious. How do people get in touch with uh, your organization? Um, our website is fearless.fund. So dot F-U-N-D, fearless.fund. We're at fearless.fund on social media, and that's how you find us, and that's how you can apply for the funding. No, absolutely. This is the incomparable Anya Simone, who is a history maker. She's going to change the world upside down. I'm glad to have you on the show. We're the better because of your life and because of your commitment oh, and because you. of your sacrifice. You've been listening to the Jamal Bryant podcast. Let's be clear. And we have not run out of time. No, we haven't. But we have. So we'll see you all. <laughs> we'll see you all on the next uh, podcast. Please, for all exclusive content, uh, you've got to go directly to jamalbryant.org so that you don't just hear us, but you'll see us and you can stay connected to us. We'll see you on the next podcast.